Great Scott! It's a secret German World War One TV set, and it's still operational. And is that who I think it is? Is that Indy Nidell there? It is indeed Indy Nidell. Hi guys, I, I very much did not expect to see you guys here. Let's thank German Engineering that this secret TV set is still operational and works two ways. Hey look, I hope I wasn't interrupting anything. No, actually, not at all, Indy. We were just demonstrating and explaining some of these World War I trench melee weapons, like this knuckle knife. And this Austrian Feldspotten. I mean, Indy, don't you talk about this kind of stuff all the time? I, I do indeed, and in fact, today, I was talking about trench assault tactics, so that's quite a coincidence. Hey, I tell you what, how about your fans come over to our show when you guys are done, and I'll send our fans over to your show. Yeah, you know, I think that's a fantastic idea. I'm sure both our viewers and yours would both really enjoy it. We should definitely do some more of this in the future, too. Yeah, greetings to Berlin from Arizona, and until then, auf Wiedersehen. And greetings to Arizona from Berlin. See you guys around. We're going to start with this quote from All Quiet on the Western Front. But the bayonet has practically lost its importance. It is usually the fashion now to charge with bombs and spades only. The sharpened spade is a more handy and many-sided weapon. Not only can it be used for jabbing a man under the chin, but it is much better for striking with because of its greater weight. And if one hits between the neck and shoulder, it easily cleaves as far down as the chest. The bayonet frequently jams on the thrust, and then a man has to kick hard on the other fellow's belly to pull it out again. And in the interval, he may easily get one himself. And what's more, the blade often gets broken off. That's Eric Maria Remark, isn't it? Yes. His, well, that's, of course, a fictional book, but it's based very much on his experiences in the Great War. Right. So, for the purposes of practical experience in combatives, it's an authentic recount. And that's pretty much what we're talking about today. Thanks for tuning in to InRange TV, guys. We're looking at some hand-to-hand -hand weapons of World War I. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are pretty familiar with the, uh, the guns, the rifles, the pistols, but there's, kind of, there's a lot of mystique surrounding trench knives and clubs and, and spades. And uh, we thought it'd be cool to touch on some of that and discuss the real history. Yeah, a lot of the combatants in World War One, it was an ex a battle of extremes. There was long mm -hmm. distance shooting with rifles across thousands of yards. That's yep. no man's land. Then there were stretches of no man's land that were just feet apart. Right. But when they went over the top, the men that made it to that other trench, it turned into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right. Go ahead and put that bayonet on your rifle. Let's take a look at that for a moment. Now, the reason that we have these long bayonets in World War One was based on the idea of rifle-to-rifle -rifle combat, mm -hmm. where you're up in the open, standing there, and you're, you're fencing a guy with a bayonet. Having that long blade, the idea was it gives you a little more reach, and it lets you stab the other guy when he can't reach you. The reach of this makes a point, and when you look at the French designs, for example, with the Rosalie, mm -hmm. it is even longer than this. That Rosalie is taller on a label than I am. The idea of that being is you could get the guy before he gets you. Right, which is all well and good, except that theory kind of falls apart when you're in a trench. Once you're in this enclosed area, this reach is actually a problem. Go ahead, stab me with it. Yeah, you, there's good an luck issue. with that. There's it doesn't an issue work. Here. Yes, and that's what uh, Remark was talking about when he said the bayonet is is of no use. Mm -hmm. When you're in a trench, that rifle is not a very good weapon, and so what you're going to go to are hand-to-hand -hand weapons. In one kind of classic style, the British troops were all carrying entrenching tools, and this is the handle for your entrenching tool hangs right here, right next to your bayonet. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's actually some, in the Australian War Memorial specifically, they have an example of what looks like a, a gear tooth knob that was manufactured to fit right on the end of this. Yeah, I call it a cog. Handle. Yeah, a cog wheel, exactly. Yeah. And uh, you slide that on and now you've got yourself a nice little club that you can use in much closer quarters. Yep, and in other ways, people started making ersatz or in the field trench clubs. This is a rather nice example. This is a replica, not an original. But you'll see it's really just a hunk of wood with some hobnails at the end and a leather strap so you don't lose it. Yep. And there were all manner of these things made with uh, round rivets, hobnails, mm -hmm. regular nails, sometimes the nail head sticking out, sometimes the nail point sticking out. You'll see actually like, like uh, you know, these villages were shelled into oblivion and guys yep. would take the leg off of a table or off of a bed turn it into a club, put nails at the end of it, some barbed wire, and that was their trench club. Yep, yeah, you'll find them wrapped in barbed wire. Their original historical pictures, or their pictures of the original items in uh, collections and museums today, showing this huge kind of creepy variety in, in things that you can hit, just hit somebody with. I think it goes without saying that this is pretty gruesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah you don't want to get hit by that. No, and we have a lot better reach here yep. than we exactly. do with the rifle. You can so. use it up close. Can indeed. So, the club, an important part became more and more so near the end of the war. Yep. Yep. 
But the Germans had some ideas around the ideas of knives, and then that became a popular thing as well. Now, we should point out that a lot of these weapons are used as a backup, not to, not necessarily to a firearm, but often to a hand grenade. Mm -hmm. In the trenches, a, a small throwable bomb was really one of the best possible weapons you could have. Right, and you'd see, like, actually, you'll find pictures of these, the German Sturmtruppen with nothing but two sacks. Right. They've ditched the rifle. They yep. may not even have a handgun. They may not have a firearm at all. Right. They've got these two sacks filled with hand grenades. Yep. They come up to the enemy trench, hurl a bunch of them over. When those things detonated, they would go to a trench knife. They go over the top of that enemy trench. Whoever was still alive, yep. coup de gras. Yeah. Or hand to hand if they're still active. Right. But so it's interesting. A lot of this this sort of raiding activity started. Um, in fact, in some cases, you'll see it claimed that it's actually started as an alternative or a, a solution to the, the high command's problem with troops that weren't interested in fighting. Uh, we know a lot about things like the the French mutiny um, and the Christmas truce. And this idea that you really did have trenches very close to each other, and the soldiers on both sides would develop a camaraderie with each other. They were often both pretty normal, simple people. They weren't really interested in, in national affairs all that much. Mm -hmm. Really weren't interested in dying for, you know, this is the second, third, fourth year of this war. What's the point? Um, you know what? How about you guys don't throw any grenades over here, and we won't throw any over there, and let's just all survive through this and go home. Which is great for the guys in the trench, but uh, not what the officers were looking for. Mm -hmm. So one of the solutions was, and, and this is in conjunction with the fact that this also is an effective combat tactic, let's start running trench raids, especially at night. We'll take a small group of people, and this could vary between just a handful of people to even hundreds of people over a wide stretch of, of the trenches, and let's have them infiltrate the enemy trenches. The goal is typically to take some prisoners and then get out. You don't try and hold the trench because you know that in the long term you can't. What you're trying to do is gather intelligence, prisoners, demoralize the enemy, and frankly, uh, in invigorate your own troops' morale by coming back successful and bringing prisoners. Mm -hmm. And the side effect of this is that it's really easy to tell if troops aren't doing it. Because if it's successful, you come back with prisoners. If it's not successful, you're going to come back with casualties. And if a trench raid goes off and, and garners neither prisoners nor any wounded or killed on your own side, it's kind of a giveaway that nothing actually happened. It's a good chance those guys crawled out to no man's land and waited it out. Right. And you can't get away with that. Mm. Very not often. forever. Yeah. Right. So these trench raiding techniques are where you'll find things like guys with nothing but grenades. And typically that guy would be part of a small squad. You'd have a couple guys with grenades. You'd almost certainly have a couple guys with firearms, mm -hmm. uh, rifles or pistols, and a lot of guys with knives. Because once you're in that trench, it's kill or be killed. It's very close combat, very intimate combat. So the knife kind of evolved. It I mean, did. The, the, German the German trench knife is really quite, of a, quite a simple blade. It's yeah. kind of almost like a kitchen knife. Sharpened yep. edge, works as either a standard grip or as an ice pick. Yep. Uh, nothing really much going on there, simple to make. However, they tried to evolve that. So this really saw limited service. But when they realized that the bayonet was too long and the trench knife was another thing to carry, mm -hmm. they played around with this idea of a what, what's now called a crank handle knife. This is a reproduction, not an original. These are quite rare and expensive, and they only made a, a relatively small number. But the idea behind this was it was a trench knife if you needed it to be. Hold on to that. But it was also your bayonet if you needed it to be. And this is an instance in which, as we see bayonets getting shorter, there's a reason for that. Shorter bayonets are actually more practical in a trench. Yep, absolutely. Turns out there wasn't a whole lot of that uh, bayonet to bayonet fencing combat. No, but it happened. But that being said, a shorter bayonet was more valuable. And you yep. saw bayonets get shorter in World War II. Absolutely. And, and for yep. those reasons. So this is kind of the first real acknowledgement of that reality. Yeah. Um, like I said, small, limited application, but they did have them. And as you can see, this is a much easier thing to get in close with yeah, you got than that long blade. Ten inches less you pull back, stuff. you can still pull. And a blade of that length is probably less prone to break. Yep. And probably less prone to get stuck on something inside the enemy. Exactly. So, an interesting combination of trench knife and bayonet. However, there's also the crude end of the spectrum. Well, at the very far crude end of the spectrum, we have something like this. Now, this is also a reproduction of what's typically called a French nail knife. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is actually kind of interesting. The actual specific origin of this thing is you'd, uh, you'd have metal poles that are holding up barbed wire, and they're pretty ubiquitous. They're everywhere out on the battlefield. And uh, you take one of those and take it to your unit blacksmith, because there's horses all over the place. You, the blacksmith was a very uh, unnecessary and very common sure. part of your, uh, your unit supply chain. 
and that blacksmith can hammer a piece of uh, barbed wire support into a knife, bend the, the thing around for a grip, flatten out the front into a, a blade, mm -hmm. sharpen it on both edges, and you've got a very simple but very effective knife. I think today, you know, people are out there spending a ton of money on really good knives. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's an entire massive market in fantastic knives, even little short knives, you know, things this size. Yep. Well, when it comes to combat like World War I, None of that matters. The quality really doesn't matter. Um, this thing is here just to, to stab the other guy. You're, you're not going to get into this intricate Hollywood looking knife fighting technique and, and no. counters and parries. It's going to be one or two items one, or one or two moves at most and someone's going to be dead or dying on the ground. An interesting idea there is you see that this also has hand protection. This is not yep. just for stabbing, it's for punching as well. Yes, As it well is. as protection of the fingers. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I can't help but fathom that a lot more of this was done ice pick. I think you're probably right. I mean, it could be either. But when you're doing this, this is where this brutal, fast, multiple stabs, move yep. on, thing happens. Punch the guy in the face, in the throat, move on. Yeah. Speaking of knives, this isn't even really a knife. No, that is just a triangular spike. Um, so a little bit of history on that thing. That is a, a model of 1918, U.S. trench knife. Mm -hmm. um, it is very similar to the U.S. model of 1917 knife, which just had some, some knuckle-type rivets down here instead of these protuberances. Um, and these were actually used by American troops. And they, they had, so there were some problems with them, but there was also some good intent. Uh, the whole reason that they have a triangular spike is they were designed for penetration. Uh, whatever the enemy might be wearing, especially if it's in the winter, enemies wearing a couple layers of heavy coat, um, you know, something like this, it'll probably go through, but it's gonna be harder to jab through a whole bunch of layers of clothing. This guy, you put a little bit of force into this, this will go right through, it'll make a really difficult, bad, a, a difficult wound to heal. Like a nail. Yeah. Plus, I mean, also, so. I mean, I don't know if this was the intended goal, and it's hard to document such a thing, but a puncture wound of that ilk, or from a Rosalie, or mm -hmm. from a Nagant bayonet, is a much harder thing to deal with yes. from a medical perspective. From a cut. A cut is one thing, you can suture that, you can irrigate it and clean it out. A puncture wound brings a lot of filth in with it. It also leaves a hole that's very hard to close. Exactly. It tends to seep for a long time. I, I tend to believe that that wasn't really the intention. Nope. I think this was designed for a functional purpose of getting penetration. Mm -hmm. um, but you, these, these did have a problem of the blades breaking. They're long, they're kind of fragile. Um, it's not uncommon to find original ones that are bent. This is an original one, by the way. Um, and even it has a little bit of deformation in the tip. Uh, so what the US actually did was they, uh, to improve this design, they copied an existing French design. This became the American 1918 Mark I uh, trench knife. Now I would say this is the infamous trench knife. Yes. If anyone thinks of a trench knife, they think of this. That's, yeah. That's I mean, what this thing just looks gnarly. Yep. Yeah. So you've actually got individual finger holes, very legitimate brass knuckles. You can hold it again either way. I agree. This is probably the, the more quick and dirty, effective. Blade front, knuckles, spike yep. rear. Yep. Uh, the nut that holds the blade in place in the handle is a, an impact weapon in and of itself. Now the Americans, these never got into the war on the American side. Uh, these were delivered in, in December of 1918. Uh, interestingly, these were actually like the only combat knives in U.S. inventory at the very beginning of World War II. Yeah. And these things actually got issued in World War II. Um, however, the French versions of these, and this is in fact a French manufactured original one made for the U.S. Um, the French versions of these did see combat. Um, this was out there. So the French had everything from the extremely simple um, and there are a bunch of examples of these documented in major museum collections. Two, the the, <laughs> the refined trench knife, if you want to call it that. You know, and that being said, if you were if you were a soldier and you were provided a way too long bayonet and a rifle, yep, and that's all you were provided, you'd be looking to make a nail knife or, or a, club. a club or something. When the guy jumps in your trench or you're jumping his trench, you're going to want something you can fight with. Exactly. And that's where this stuff came from. Now you know it's interesting to point out. You mentioned that if you're provided with a rifle and a bayonet. Well, some of these were actually issued weapons. The Germans in particular, the trench knives, mm -hmm. were sometimes privately procured, but they were widely issued to mm -hmm. troops. The British did not issue, issue trench knives. And this led actually to a number of companies making combat trench knives on the private market and selling them commercially. And a lot of troops would buy these on their own. There was um, some of that on the German market as well. You'll see yes. what are called hunting knives or Jaeger knives, or I'm not going to try to pronounce it all the way. But it's, it actually is a hunting knife in that it's, an, it's like a leg of an animal with a blade on it. Yeah. It looks very neat. But those were actually procured and used on the front as well. Right. So. I'm sure it happened everywhere. Yeah. Um, but the British had some particularly interesting and inspired designs. 
Um, this is a replica of a Robbins Dudley punch dagger. And I think this really kind of gets at the, the reality of knife fighting in World War I, which is, again, you don't have, you know, Bruce Lee out there doing ninja moves with a knife and, you know, and having a, spending five minutes dueling someone. You've got, you jump in the trench, guy doesn't know you're there, stab him, move on. This was also a very easy to train on device. Exactly. You don't really need to know anything about knife fighting. Nope. All you do is put that in your hand and just start punching the hell out of whoever you're trying to kill. Yeah. Um, when you said the reality is World War One knife fighting, I think just like gun lore, mm -hmm. there's a lot of lore around the reality of what knife fighting is. Oh, I think there's more of it around knife there's fighting. There's the whole martial art thing even in modern day, and the reality is a much more brutal, yep. fast, horrific thing. It's the difference between actual sword fighting mm -hmm. and sport, sporterized combat. Fencing. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Um, a, true knife, a true sword fight is one or two or maybe three moves, and then someone's... If the other guy's lucky to parry, he was good. Or yep. lucky. Yep. And it's usually the second cut or third that, that ends the fight. Right. Yeah. If the guy's not dead, he's uh, incapacitated. And not, not any different with close combat knife fighting. What's important, w with this sort of combat, what was important was not finesse. It wasn't necessarily technique. It was speed and violence and not hesitating. Speed and violence of action and the ability or the willingness to take brutality to, to a level higher than the guy you're uh, opposing. Exactly. Which on, uh, honestly is still modern combatives. That's true. Yeah. yeah, nothing about that has changed, but no. you sure don't see it exemplified the way it was in World War I. No, true. Absolutely. So, so what, that's all said. So we've gone through the club, and we kind of talked about why these things exist with the long bayonets. And we talked about the punch daggers and the knives, but really the bell of the ball. Is the, the trowel. Simple, the simple spade. Yep, the field shovel. We started with a quote from All Quiet on the Western Front about this, and there's a lot of reasons for this. One, most guys had one. That's true. They were, were provided this. And you were using it a lot. You're doing a lot of digging in World War One. Not only were you making your trenches in the little hole that was going to save your life, mm -hmm. if this is what you had and you did not get one of these issued to you or you hadn't bought one, you put an edge on this and you've got a pretty interesting shovel axe melee weapon. It's kind of like an inefficient hatchet. It is. And this idea is still manifested. You'll still see it in Russian doctrine today. Yep. The, the Spetsnaz are still big on the, the trowel or the shovel. But the Germans really put an art to it. Everyone used them in World War I. The Germans are kind of most well known for it. Yeah. This happens to be a 1915 Austrian uh, field spade, Feldspaten. And this is an original example, too. This is an original. This thing's got a 1915 date on it. The edges are sharpened. They've, it's 100 years ago. They're not as sharp as they were probably then. But you can see that there wasn't a sharpened edge put on this for that purpose. All the way around it, in fact. All the way around it, which yeah. is when, we were, when you listen to that quote from Remark, it's not just for cleaving, it's for up. Yep. All those it's things. For everything. You can also use it to parry. Yeah. And this is something you had. Right. Every Almost every soldier had a spot right. or a spade or an A tool. I do want to point out, you wouldn't find this so much in the British Army because they had a different design of tool. Right. They had a separate handle, kind of like an American style pickmatics, where you'd have a, a, a shovel blade and pickaxe that would slide onto this thing. And it, in that form, it doesn't make a very good uh, weapon. But you know what? You got this metal capped club right here. And that's mm -hmm. what they used instead. But you're sitting in your trench at night. I don't know, let's say it's 11 o'clock at night. You got some little candle there burning. The rats are running around probably. Yep. And the guys, some enemies jump over the side. Do you pick up your giant rifle and try to do something with that? Or do you grab this, which is right there next to you, and just try to beat them to death? Yep. I, I think it's an obvious choice, and I think this is why this became the case. Yeah. yeah. But an entire, really, doctrine of arms came about, about the E-Tool as yeah. a weapon. Yeah, it's really interesting. It, it did develop a, an actual line of studied and perfected martial art, really. Mm -hmm. um, certainly didn't start that way. No. With that said, I, I don't know if there's anything more to say about this except that it really brings home the brutality of what the Great War was. Yeah. World War I was, a, was an awful, awful thing with an incredible toll on human life. Yeah. And, and psyche a, on those who survived I was going to say that, and the psyche. And when you think about things like this, cleaving men's heads off with a shovel just because you're on the other side. Yep. Hard to get over that. Yeah. So anyways, let's move away from that. Let's demonstrate some of this. Yeah, sure. All right, guys, so we're gonna actually demonstrate some of this. We're not martial artists per se, and we don't play them on TV. Nope, well, Neither we one. do play them on YouTube today. <laughs> so that being said, we've got the Car 98 here. The bolt is out of the gun. This gun is essentially neutered. And we have the bayonet, the long bayonet, mounted with the sheath on it, making it essentially not quite as pointy. And Ian here has the Austrian E-Tool, which we're going to demonstrate a little bit of how this kind of might have gone. Yep. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with a lunge, slow-mo, we're doing this all slow-mo. I'm going to come in with a lunge with this gigantic butcher blade. We're going to kind of demonstrate how this could have gone. You know, it's pretty easy to uh, see it coming. You tell them. Yeah. 
or either one of those is going to incapacitate me, or if I get inside and I still deflect that shovel. Now, now we're just in hand to hand, but look at that. Yep, you've disarmed me. I can control the, the rifle here. You got the fight here. Now this has turned into this is <laughs> literally a fist fight, or give him the gun and switch to this. Yep. But now you're to hand to hand with small weapons again. We want to do the same thing. Carl is taking his life in his hands because we do not have a sheath for this. Yeah, do not stab me. I, I prefer to have my liver in functional order. So we're going to come in with this. Same thing, right? Yeah. You know what? Much. This thing's big, it's slow, it's easy to sidestep it. Now let's go slow and I'm going to try and recover and you can st you're still going to get behind me. You ready? Yep. Yeah. There's no, I had no choice. And I can grab this thing. You got it. Yeah. Nothing. Yep. So it became pretty evident to the guys in the trenches. That's a liability. This kind of sucks. Yep. Doesn't work. Long blade. Even the blade by itself would be a problem. Yeah. It's too long. It's, it's like having a short sword, except that it's not designed to be usable as a sword. This sort of bayonet was intended to be a protection against cavalry, so that you could actually use this thing as a pike against a man on a horse, and it was intended to give you the most reach, so that if I have one of those as well, now you're in this kind of specialty combat, and, uh, and the guy with the longer rifle has the advantage. Mm -hmm. As soon as you're in tight quarters, where that thing can't be maneuvered around easily, or the enemy happens to be this close to you. And you're with now, your forget it. Poke, stab, punch. You've taken control of this. You've essentially right. given the rifle to your opponent. Yeah. You've let them, so I mean, put the knife down for a minute. All right, so don't break my gun, but what I'm gonna do is go like this. Just give it a grab here and give a good yank when I'm doing it. So you'll see me move, you ready? Mm -hmm. So if I'm thrusting and he gets a hold of the rifle, I'm screwed. <laughs> You know, really screwed. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to note that uh, the U.S. Army and I believe also the French Army, at least, and probably some others, mm -hmm. actually specifically started including judo in their hand-to-hand -hand combat training as far back as World War One. Yeah, um, there was at the, the Fort Benning Infantry School for the United States. The the close quarters combat, the hand-to-hand -hand combat, was actually being taught uh, by a couple of master instructors. One of them was an authentic. In 1916, he got his black belt in jiu-jitsu in Japan uh, from the Kodokan, I believe. I may be mispronouncing that. Um, and also a championship boxer. Um, they were actually, if you look at the hand-to-hand -hand combat manuals of the time, not only were they using these advanced sporting techniques, they were also using um, you know, a, a doctrine that was built largely on foul blows. Um, there was a lot of talk of gouging eyes. Uh, often targeting the groin, always move to hit the groin. Mm -hmm. If a man's on the ground, where are the best places to stomp on him to do the most damage? Mm -hmm. The neck, like the, the lowest rib right down here. This was brutal combat. Um, and they started recognizing it. They were still issuing bayonets and doing bayonet drill, uh, but people pretty quickly realized that that wasn't going to be sufficient, and that wasn't the most important thing to the soldier in the trench. And you see modern military applications of this concept. So, for example, or one of the popular things now is uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, mm -hmm. BJJ. Yep. Similar thing. Um, you see the uh, the Soviets, where the Russians with with their um, Sistema, mm -hmm. and a couple of their methods, and the Israelis have their own as well. The Krav Maga. Krav yeah. Maga, and all that's based around. I mean, this really those lines go straight back to World War One. Yeah. yeah, and earlier. Of and course. earlier, it's but not, I mean, it's not like this stuff got invented for World War One, but boy, it sure got a lot of use. That's where you saw it manifest. Yeah, let's move to some of the smaller weapons yeah. and give us a similar demonstration. So here we're going to do a couple more demonstrations of different weapons versus different weapons. We've gotten rid of the rifle. We've decided that thing is um, sort of useless in this trench raiding combatives. Yeah, and so I've got this trench club, and you've got your French nail knife. Air sots, at, made out of a bent piece of metal. Yeah. So this is where this could kind of go. So coming over the front top. Disarm, boom. So what's happening there is, this is common even in current uh, fencing, rapier fencing. Mm -hmm. You actually target hands and wrists. The guy's got a weapon there. You don't want him to get close to you with that. You don't want him to get, want, want him to get within your ability to strike with the club. Because with the club, even if in close range, if, we're, if he's inside me, the club is now worthless, right? So you got to get rid of that. So coming over here again, boom, 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 yeah. Now I'm screwed. As we said, how many how many strikes was that? Three? Three. Two or three strikes. Minimum. That's it. That's all it is. It's yep. all like that. And you know, if you watch the original training uh, videos, mm -hmm. or training, uh, well, film strips, it mm -hmm. would have been at the time, while they're not typically using weapons, it's usually hand-to-hand, -hand, it is something to get the guy on the ground, and then a combination of two or three strikes 
in different places to incapacitate them once they're on the ground. You would have to be a really hard-nerved individual if you were armed with that and this came at you like this and you didn't try to do something. I mean, there's a chance. I mean, maybe you'd move in or you'd be that good, but really you're probably gonna block. How, how long are these guys actually surviving? So if you were to block like that and then... Yep. Yep, they're on the ground. Kick, hit. And then it's this. Yep. <laughs> Essentially. Stomp. Move on to the next guy. Nasty stuff. Yeah. You know, the people in the trenches are not these, you know, years of training no. combatives, martial artists. They're recruits. They're bakers. Yep. They're they were conscripts. making bread or they were binding books yep. or they were farming. And so what happens is when you get the guys who are willing and able to, to you know, use this sort of thing to maximum effect, they're really going to walk over people who are unsure of themselves, who are hesitating, and who don't know how to react. Mm -hmm. I think once you got seasoned trench raiders, they became really fearsome opponents until they just happened to get killed by a bayonet or, or by a, a grenade or a one lucky guy with a or knife. Or they decide to take all of the best and put them at the front of the spear for Operation Michael. Yep. And then and it goes them until they're dead. It goes until they're gone and they're out and all you got left are the, the bakers. The bakers again. And the, the book binders. Yeah. All right, so one more last demonstration. We were talked about the spade being kind of the, the bell of the ball. Yeah. And I, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. It's got the heft, it's got an ax, you can dig a hole with it. It's also a shield. I mean, defending with this is a way different game. Right? I mean, it's right. Quick. That's the thing is that this gives you something else which you don't have with any of this. Right. Is a shield, quite yeah. honestly. Um, and once you, and, and this still, you can, you can crank in on this and we can still talk about if we get in close. So I'm gonna defeat, what we're gonna do is you're gonna block and I'm gonna get in on you and then I'm just gonna move in, okay? So we're gonna block. Yeah. Yeah, there's not a whole lot you can do with a club Not at that point, but at this, you can crank up on this and you can start using it as another tool. Yeah. So this is why this, for, for the nature of it being prolific and most soldiers had one, also became, it had advantages. It was kind of a club and a knife all at once. Yeah. So I, I think that's where this became the definitive trench tool. Yeah. Not for the uh, squeamish. No, none of this is. So, all right. So in this instance, this is another example of real world things that happened all the time. Tommy here got into the trench on a trench raid unnoticed. Yep. I'm sitting around bored, probably been there for hours. By the way, that's kind of the point of a trench raid is you sneak over at night. Mm -hmm. So you're not gonna wanna make a lot of noise. Nope. You've got your blade there, right? I got a spike on a stick. So let's, let's kind of demonstrate what that would look like. So critical, very easy way, easy place to hit someone, and there's a lot of important stuff right here. Right there. You know what, the spike on this is really gnarly and long, and that's going way down into the person. Down to here. And because it's a spike, there's very little resistance, and it doesn't take, you know, a super human weightlifter dude to jab this way into that the person. Note. That's, re that's a reason I really think a lot of this ice pick stuff is, has validity. Yeah. It still does today, of course, but the, when you just demonstrated that, this takes nothing but a hammer blow down, a pullback and a hammer blow down, and you're gonna get probably the whole thing in. Yeah. Um, same thing applies to the side. Just in the back. There's that also, there's that is practical knife fighting for World War I. There's also the scissor side of this, where if you're in an ice pick, you just pretty much come in and you just start doing this. Yep. Just jabbing, jabbing, jabbing. But gnarly. Very. <laughs> yeah. Pretty horrible. If you'd like to know more about the use of where, where this all fell in the grander scheme of World War I, we would strongly recommend that you go check out The Great War. It's uh, an ongoing channel which every week shows you what happened this week, 100 years ago in World War I. As well as really cool little other videos about I did what in World War I, and they like put little excerpts or videos specifically about individuals. Yes. Very and, cool. And specific subjects. Really, there is an, a plethora of material over there to see, and it's extremely well done, and we both really enjoy watching it. If you're interested in military history or World War I or both, which I can't imagine you're not interested in both, or you're interested in one or the other, yeah. uh, I cannot recommend this channel highly enough. It's yep. fantastic. So. Fantastic. Go check out The Great War. We'll uh, put a link in the description below to their specific, uh, well, the, the video they're doing on this same subject, on trench raiding as uh, on a larger scale. Which is what inspired this collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. So, and we're thankful for that. Um, that being said, hopefully you enjoy InRange and thank you for watching another InRange video. If, uh, if you find this kind of stuff, the kind of things you want to see uh, regarding firearms and military history, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Patreon is what funds us and gives us the ability to do this. Um, if you can't, totally get it, totally understand that. Just share the video, subscribe, let your friends know about it, and that's just as valuable. And we thank you for watching, and tune in for another one.